first, let me do a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me? If you can, just indicate in the chat or over um, in the feedback window. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. So I have a number of examples of different initiatives, projects, and um, other really great examples of the major areas listed up on your screen. This is by no means an exhaustive list of how scholarly communication plays out in academic libraries, but it does demonstrate that there is lots of engagement and excitement and collaboration in these areas. So to establish the foundation for the examples that I'll be talking about in the presentation, I'd first like to present this definition of scholarly communication from the University of Kansas Libraries. This definition, definition resume, resonates with me because, first of all, it acknowledges that scholarly communication is complex, and it is a complex system. It also acknowledges that products of scholarship can be both formal and informal, and it references the issues and pressures that create stress within the system, and also that create opportunities to help people um, capitalize and be creative within and outside of the system. So I'd like to start with open access, given that we're currently celebrating Open Access Week. The first example is from um, Parkland College, which is a community college in Champaign, Illinois. Scholarship at Parkland, or SPARC, is unique in that it provides community college faculty and students the opportunity to share their work openly. And it, the repository focuses on the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, I love this example, first of all, for the acronym. I have acronym ENVY when it comes to SPARC. Uh, second of all, um, it's a local example, and it's also one of the only community college repositories that I'm familiar with. And if other people know of others, please feel free to share in the chat. Um, I just think it's a really wonderful model of how community colleges um, are part of the scholarly communication process in the creation and dissemination of what their students and faculty are doing on their campuses. Um, SPARC is also a great case study and a model of collaboration. Erica Hackman, the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, and Sherry Cameron, the Parkland College um, archivist in the library, work together to administer the collection. Their efforts have not gone unnoticed. SPARC received the 2014 Community and Junior College Library Section EBSCO Community College Learning Resources Award for their work on SPARC. And that was just awarded um, at the ALA conference in uh, Las Vegas. The award committee co-chairs noted that SPARC displayed exceptional innovation and offered promise for long-term impact. Their example helps foster the concept of institutional repositories at other community colleges, and in doing so, validates the work of students at two-year colleges as worthy of scholarly consideration. The next example I have is from Oberlin College in Ohio. OB Maps is um, a really amazing project. Um, as you can see, it's from the Oberlin Center for Languages and Cultures. And it's an online tool created by the faculty and also instructional technologists there that brings together information about courses, faculty members, study abroad programs, allowing the user to search by a location, such as Spain, um, about time periods, themes such as gender, and languages. It's, a it's a, an amazing and robust tool that, according to its website, groups and links courses and faculty, not through administrative structures, but by the actual content of their courses and intellectual or artistic projects. It's a fascinating look into an, a liberal arts institution, and each entry for faculty links to that person's work in SHARES, the Oberlin College um, and Conservatory repository. 
is a wonderful example of how repository content that's open access can be pushed out to users in different ways <coughs> through different venues. I encourage you to look at OB Maps and play around with it. Um, it's one of those things that's hard to explain. Um, and I wish I could have put like four or five screenshots of this up on the presentation. Um, but it's a really interesting experiment um, with technology and with publicly available data through course catalogs and course schedules and um, faculty expert databases. So take a look at it. It's really, really interesting. It's really great. Okay. <clears throat> Our next example is from Iowa State University, which has an impressively high rate of faculty engagement. If you go to their repository and click on profiles, you will see a huge list of faculty who have con uh, made a contribution to the repository through green archiving, through post prints or working papers, um, gray literature, all sorts of things. So I talked with Harrison Inafuku, the digital repository, repository coordinator yesterday, and he credits the faculty investment and focus on outreach for their enthusiasm for the repository. He also credits the land grant mission of the institution as a major force in forming this um, faculty culture that values extension and sharing of knowledge and work. Harrison's outreach efforts highlight the visibility and impact advantages of green archiving, um, archiving post prints of articles. Um, he also encourages healthy competition between schools and departments and emphasizes the extension mission of the, uni of the university to the community when he goes out and talks with faculty and schools. So next up is data, and I love this image because it sums up um, perhaps how we all feel about data writ large. So academic libraries are becoming increasingly involved and established as trusted point people and as trusted resources on their campuses for data services writ large. Um, one example that I don't have a slide for, but there is a lot of information out there, not only in the library literature, but also on the website, um, is Purdue University. They have um, really done a wonderful job of, establish, of establishing services around data management and data curation. They also have um, a forthcoming volume on data literacy coming out soon. And they've developed an instrument called the Data Curation Profiles instrument, which um, they have shared openly and welcome any sort of comment or um, editing to help them improve the tool. And basically it gives um, us, other librarians, a template for going out and talking to our faculty about the work that they're doing, the data they're collecting, um, and it has a whole set of questions that are just incredibly helpful in framing the issue and gathering information. Allegra, that was Purdue. You're welcome. So in addition to Purdue, um, there's also um, this wonderful initiative from Haverford College called Project Tier. And um, this is really just an amazing intersection of information literacy and scholarly communication concepts and instruction. It's also a great example of how librarians and faculty members can collaborate around teaching students um, about ethics and documentation um, and how students have the opportunity to share that uh, based on the work that they've done. So Project Tier is a longtime collaboration between associate librarian, librarian Norm Medeiros and associate professor of economics Richard Ball. Um, Project Tier, Teaching Integrity in Empirical Research, not only teaches students about documenting their work with data, but it also gives students the opportunity to disseminate and share their work through Dataverse and through Triceratops, the institutional repository that Haverford shares with Bryn Mawr and Swarthmore. 
Um, I've noted that um, not I've noted not only the project website, but I've also noted that they their interview that was recently on the Library of Congress digital preservation blog. Um, the interview gives a lot of information about how the protocol was developed, um, what led to the collaboration, and how they've been sharing it out to other social science faculty, um, not only in their region and or in the economics discipline, um, but also nationwide. Um, so this this is another great example of um, how scholarly communication can play out in different ways in the classroom and then also extending to open access. The next example I have is at James Madison University, which is a master's institution in Virginia. Um, and I talked briefly with Yasmin Shorish, who is pictured there on the slide. Um, and she is um, a relatively new librarian, and she has done a really amazing job at um, marshalling the forces around data at her institution. Um, I talked to her yesterday briefly, and when she first arrived on campus, there was um, this awareness of data, but there was really very little engagement with faculty. So what she did with um, her colleagues is she got together with the Office of Research, Campus Intellectual Property um, staff, Campus IT, the library, and um, got them together and started talking about data and data management. Um, and it was very much driven by the NSF um, mandate that came out a few years ago. In that, and that was three years ago. So the conversation um, really made the case for the library taking point and leading to additional conversations with departmental um, IT staff. And it was, it turned out to be a great place to start the conversation because then she could go out to faculty and say, we can do this. We can help you with your data. We can help you with data management. We can help you find the right repository. We can help you with all different aspects of data in your work. And um, we have the backing and support of information technology on our campus. So those initial conversations and the initial outreach she did to the stakeholders on campus um, really formed a very strong foundation for her work. So right now, three years later, um, it's still going well, and she's finding that as time goes on, um, she, termed, she called it kind of a slow burn. So every year there's a little bit more interest and a little bit more interest. Um, one really interesting project she told me about is a statewide co cooperative to develop a data management curriculum. Um, and it's called the Data Management Boot Camp. Um, and it's a partnership between University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, JMU, I believe Old Dominion is also involved, and a few others. Um, there's a lot of interest in this initiative from faculty and administrators, um, far more than last year. Um, Yasmin credits their outreach efforts and also a higher awareness of the OSTP memo that was released um, from the federal government um, that has uh, caused so much interest in this program. Um, I should also mention that this is a highly hands-on kind of um, effort. So students are learning how to locate data and download it and how to manipulate it. Um, and it's really a great case study in how a state um, has recognized the need for more education around data and data management and everything that entails. And, has worked, and the, how the schools have come together to create um, a curriculum to support that. All right. So libraries are also creating spaces within their physical buildings um, to help students with data. Two examples of this um, are the Data Studio at the Robert E. Kennedy Library at um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, 
the Data Studio uh, is a space um, in the library dedicated to helping students learn to use software and hardware related to data, and also to work collaboratively, collaboratively with each other and with faculty. Um, there's also the Empirical Reasoning Lab at uh, Barnard um, in New York, and this is also a space dedicated to a wide variety of data needs for students and faculty. Um, and you, if you visit their websites, there's far more information um, than I've described here. But I think these are fantastic examples of how um, libraries are creating um, these opportunities for to bring in specialists and to um, work collaboratively, collaboratively with undergraduates, graduates, and faculty to help bolster data literacy and data management skills and awareness um, through these spaces. Um, a common theme here is hands-on work. Um, also, experiential learning with data, specialized assistants, um, not always with librarians. Um, oftentimes, they employ graduate assistants from departments um, who have facility and knowledge of different statistical packages. And they also um, answer a range of data needs. So you can see in the um, empirical reasoning lab example above, they talk about organizing data, analyzing data, and visualizing data. Um, so these are two great examples, and I'm sure there's more, and if anybody knows of um, or has um, one at your institution, please do share in the comments. So a little bit more on data. Um, there seems to be this great groundswell of um, activity and interest and professional development opportunities. So first I'd like to mention um, that a call is now up on the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication website for um, articles related to um, research data. And the call has a lot more information, but this is very widely cast. So we're talking about educational um, um, projects. We're talking about working with software and hardware. Um, check out the call if you're interested, because we'd love to have your submissions. Also, there will be a pre-conference about data management at the ACRL conference next um, year in Portland, Oregon. Um, and the registration for both the conference itself and the pre-conference um, is up on the ACRL website. Finally, ACRL um, is also publishing an edited volume on data librarianship um, in spring 2015, and the URL there will take you to um, a call for proposals, and that will be co-edited by two librarians, um, and I apologize, I did not write down their names, but um, they're there on the call for proposals. So at this point, I just want to take um, a quick moment to see if there are any questions or examples or comments that people would like to share, and you can go ahead and do that in the um, chat box. Okay, seeing none, I will move forward. Oh. So Bob has a question. Um, does anyone see data management as something other than digital humanities? Uh, data management can be a lot of, um, can relate to many different disciplines, not just digital humanities. I think we're seeing, um, at least on my own campus, interest from the sciences and also social sciences. Um,
the Purdue website has a lot of great information about data management, um, as does the JMU website that I referenced earlier. But that's a great question. Oh, I should also mention um, our psychology faculty here are getting more interested in data management and also um, needing places to uh, to store their data so when um, their articles are published, they can share that data easily. Um, so that's another, uh, and our psychology department is um, a mix of social science and science. So it's been interesting to work with them uh, to answer their questions and also find solutions for them. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to address is open educational resources. Uh, so this is a really interesting area. Um, this is uh, a definition from the Hewlett Foundation that I found, and um, this is a commonly accepted definition, I think, of open educational resources. And OERs can be just about anything. They can be textbooks, they can be courses, they can be modules, they can be streaming videos, um, and really anything that's open and out there for people to use in their learning, um, for people to uh, adapt for different um, contexts or environments or kinds of students. Um, so this is a really great area for exploration, especially for academic libraries. Um, state legislatures are also paying uh, very close attention to open educational resources, and for good reason. Uh, since 1978, the cost of college textbooks has increased 812%. That's more than medical services, new home prices, and the consumer price index. And that's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So when you think about the cost of education, um, even at state-supported institutions, um, the cost of textbooks is often so high that students go without, which directly impacts their learning and directly impacts their engagement in the class. So the um, initiatives that, um, that I have to talk about have really faced that directly and made it possible for faculty to um, devise their own open educational resources in the form of texts, usually. Um, but they've also created a moment of advocacy for students and involved the students in that, in those efforts. <clears throat> oh, I'm not sure what happened to that image. So the first example I'd like to talk about is uh, open educational resources at Grand Valley State University. Um, Grand Valley State is in Michigan, and it is um, very active in this area. It's also very active in journal publishing on their campus. So a common question that Sarah Bobian receives around, about their OER initiatives is how, how these are vetted. What kind of process um, do these works go through? And in, in some cases, they are vetted through um, a process um, within the department. In other cases, with faculty colleagues of the author. The library itself does not provide that kind of service. However, the library does provide services um, in terms of helping faculty find um, or helping faculty find the right home for their textbook. Um, also, in the case of Bent Not Broken, that's actually a multimedia um, book, um, which is really fascinating. And it's available not only as a download, but also as an iTunes, um, as an iTunes app. Um, the download statistics um, for the OER content um, are pretty impressive, as Sarah termed it, and a couple of the titles are regularly in the top downloaded items in the repository. Um, 
So this is a growing program, and if you visit their site, you'll see that these are just a few examples, and I selected them because they represent um, engagement from different disciplines. So you have a writing spaces volume, and you also have mathematical reasoning. There's also, um, I believe, a physiology text on the site, um, in, in, in addition to a calculus text as well. And the same goes for the program, the OER program at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I want to give um, a huge amount of credit to Marilyn Billings and Charlotte Rowe for their work on open educational resources um, at UMass Amherst. Um, their efforts began in the spring of 2011 with a faculty incentive program that was funded by the provost office and the library. So the faculty incentive program um, took the form of mini grants that encouraged the creation of new teaching materials, the use of library subscription materials, or the use of existing open um, free information sources to support student learning. There are several success stories um, that uh, UMass Amherst um, can uh, be proud of in terms of their OER efforts. Um, and I, I think the strongest, the strongest uh, reason for that is they have saved students over a million dollars since the beginning of this initiative, um, which is just amazing. So one of the things they did is really built up student advocacy around this project. And um, in Massachusetts, um, they found that students spend an average of $1,200 a year on textbooks and supplies. And this represents 79.8% of a student's summer earnings if they work full time at, in Massachusetts at minimum wage. 65% of the students surveyed decided not to buy a textbook due to its cost. So you can see that this program is having a huge impact on access and on learning and on students being able to engage with their courses and their faculty. So the libraries help faculty create OERs by providing workshops around copyright and licensing. Um, they train faculty as well. The liaisons do outreach to faculty around the mini grants, so they provide consulting. They also help with creating new content, licensing materials for class use, and they're also partners with the Center for Teaching and Faculty Development, Academic Computing, and the Center for Educational Software Development. Um, I've noted the guide um, from UMass Amherst on the slide. I, I, I encourage you to go look at it um, it's chock full of videos and links and different models. Um, it also has links to um, different sites like Connections and Flat World Knowledge um, that they use to help get the word out about their textbooks. So Grand Valley isn't the only one in addition to um, UMass Amherst that's working on this. Um, Temple University also has a very active alternative textbook project. Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville just started a pilot this year for open educational resources, um, as did North Carolina State University. Um, also, my own institution, um, Illinois Wesleyan, just received a grant, a collaborative grant with Augustana College, Elmhurst, and St. Norbert College. And the goal is to build a repository of digital learning resources to focused on developing skills in information literacy, communication and presentation skills, and technological adaptability. And that's just getting off the ground. Um, the first deadline for proposals is coming up in November. And I see Allegra um, has posted the Cal State San Marcos Calm program, um, which is another program dedicated to creating open textbooks. Um, also, if you look at the Start Spark website, Spark has recently expanded their focus not only um, 
not only are they advocating for open access, but they're also talking more about open data and open educational resources. Nicole Allen, who is a new staff member at SPARC, is an expert on these issues, and she is incredibly well-versed um, and articulate about why open educational resources make an impact on student learning and student engagement. Uh, SPARC has a list of in initiatives by state, and you will see that California just passed two bills in their Senate that will create a collection of open access textbooks. And so Park was very involved in the lobbying for that bill, um, those bills to pass. Um, in the past, New York has also been um, engaged in this effort, and you will see a lot of other examples on that list. So I can't I can't impress upon you enough how important this is going to be in the coming years as state funding continues to drop. Um, and if state funding drops, that will directly impact our budgets in higher education. Um, so this is something that is very important and um, the more we can do around this, the better. And just as an FYI, there have been two open education weeks um, so far, one in 2013, another in 2014. The next one is in March, um, and there's no website for it yet, but you can follow them on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, and also look at the archived materials that were out there. And this is sponsored by the Open Education Consortium. I also believe there was an open education um, conference in the fall, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't have that information at my fingertips. But again, this is something that's becoming more and more important um, as we go forward. And I'll stop here to see if there are any other questions or any comments. John, that is a great question, and um, I, I suspect that there will be a lot of pushback. I haven't heard of much yet. Perhaps others have. Um, and I see there's also a question from Vicki Ludwig. Are all the conventional textbooks open access, or did the library purchase unlimited access? Um, I believe that the Examples that I showed um, from Grand Valley and also UMass Amherst, um, those were open access. Um, but I think there are cases of libraries purchasing unlimited access to textbooks. I believe North Carolina State University is one of those institutions. And Will Cross, who is this a scholarly communications um, librarian at NCSU, would be a good person to ask about that. Um, and I will just type his name in here. I don't have his email at my fingertips. Um, I, again, going back to Vicki's question, they can include them in their OER materials. I think it depends. I think that there are materials out there already that faculty can use to create their own OER textbooks. Um, Flat World Knowledge and Connections provide um, Creative Commons license materials that, student, that faculty can adapt for their classes. Faculty may also be writing their own textbooks um, that they then either license Creative Commons or provide and provide openly accessible. Thank you, Molly, for Will's email. Um, so I think there's no one there's no one model. There are lots of different models to look at. Um, so there was also a question about case studies. Um, I think the two sites that I mentioned um, are two good places to start. The Temple website may also be helpful. Um, the UMass Amherst site um, has 
I don't know if you'd term them case studies, but there's lots of examples out there of how OERs um, are coming into play. Um, and both Marilyn and Sarah, Marilyn Billings at UMass Amherst and Sarah Bobian, I'm sure would be more than happy to talk with you um, about their experiences. And during Open Education Week, I believe there will be um, a lot more sharing of what's going on. And um, Kara posted the information about the, where did it go? It was just there. Open Education Conference, um, which is November, just coming up in DC, Washington, DC. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, moving right along. Okay, so, <clears throat> pardon. There are some great examples out there about how academic librarians and academic libraries are restructuring and being very creative to address scholarly communications. And this is one of my favorite examples ever. I love this. Um, so the University of Central Florida created this research life cycle um, that is a direct reflection of um, how it works at their institution. And this is not a live, this is just a screenshot, but if you go to their live site, which I've linked here below, and you click on these different colored um, circles, they will take you either to the office that can help you with that aspect of the research life, life cycle or the place within the library that can provide more services and help to you. I think this is so brilliant um, and really wonderful. The um, UCF library is also unique in that um, they have a loosely formed advisory group consisting of over 20 librarians and staff volunteers from eight departments and across all divisions in their library. They hold monthly meetings, decide what projects to tackle, and then work towards those goals. And this information, I should say, is from um, Penny Biley from UCF, who is the Associate Director for Information Services and Scholarly Communication. So they don't have one person identified as the scholarly communications librarian. They delegate the responsibilities based on this life cycle model. So for example, they have a metadata librarian who provides assistance with describing data, another librarian who trains on citation metrics, and another who does a lot with researcher profiles. They have a, sem a series of eight workshops this fall called Publishing in the Academy. And as Penny says, we have taken a conception to completion approach and try to provide some support for almost every step of the scholarly communication process, or at least point people to other units that provide those services. If you visit their website, um, their scholarly communications website, um, which is embedded in the link that you see on the screen, um, there's a lot more information about what they do and I think this is a great model um, because not everyone can um, afford to hire one person to do scholarly communication. Um, and also, as we noted, noted before with the definition of scholarly communi communication, it's a complex system and it's a complex set of working parts that all work together, sometimes don't work together. Um, so it, it is difficult as one person to keep track of it all. So I love this model. I think it's really wonderful. Okay, our next example, um, ORCID at Texas A&M. So Gail Clement, who is the scholarly communications librarian at Texas A&M, um, brought together a small team from the university libraries to respond to a call for proposals from ORCID. Um, ORCID was looking to um, encourage more adoption and integration of ORCID ID um, at different institutions. So in late fall 2013, um, Texas A&M secured a, a small um, an award from this project. And 
to begin, they have assigned over 10,000 ORCID identifiers to graduate students um, at the master's and doctoral levels who are enrolled as of February 2014. Um, anyone who received an ORCID ID from the university libraries has a record in the master file and campus directory. So what they are doing now is um, they are going to integrate ORCIDs into their ETD submission and management system so that all theses and dissertations from 2014 onward will be automatically associated with the author's ORCID ID. Um, and basically, the or uh, the ORCID ID um, acts as a permanent stable identifier for that person. And if you go to the website, there's a lot more information and also a short video about um, the value that ORCID ID can provide to these early, early career researchers. Um, in fact, I was just working with a class this morning where a student was using a researcher's name to try to track down an article, um, and we were having no luck until we used the, the name of the article to search in the database. And I couldn't help think, like, if we could only use ORCID for this, it would be much easier because it's unique to the person. Um, again, uh, this is at the very beginning of their process. Um, I really look forward to seeing how this develops. Um, and I should also note that Texas A&M was among a group of perhaps 12 to 15 institutions um, that received grants. Um, and it's not up on the slide, but there were, there was a webinar series um, about engagement and adoption and integrating ORCID ID, and you can find that on the ORCID website. And Gail actually has a video up there about her work. All right. Just a few more examples, and I'm going to go fast because I'm running out of time. Um, library publishing. This is an incredibly exciting area. Um, and as you can see, there is um, a group, an organization dedicated to library publishing. Um, they recently ratified their bylaws, and we now have a board. Um, that will guide our organization. Um, you can also see here there's a definition of library publishing. Um, I should note that library publishing um, products are um, wide and various, and you will find many of them on institutional repositories. Um, I should also note that there are some very active um, library publishers out there in academic libraries. Um, Amherst College Press is a great example at a liberal arts institution. There's also powerhouses at Research One institutions, Purdue, University of Michigan. Um, the University of North Texas is just beginning in to um, set up um, publishing in this area. And also, again, Grand Valley State University. Um, there's, there will be a library publishing forum for two days after the um, ACRL conference next spring, and it will be located at Portland State University. Um, registration is open to all, and registration is currently up and going on the Library Publishing Coalition website. I should also put in a plug for the library publishing directory, which is available online and in print. Okay, this is one of my favorite um, examples of digital scholarship initiatives. This is um, a, an inter, a really wonderful multimedia um, product by McAllister you know, um, College in Minnesota. It's um, a seven-year collaboration between the library and a faculty member. Um, it incorporates interactive multimedia into the text, image galleries, audio excerpts from interviews with former um, prisoner of war, um, and realizations of original music written by the POWs, and, and video clips that investigate the artifacts more closely. Um, this is a really, really wonderful um, um, compilation and publication um, that McAllister has put on their um, institutional repository. Uh, 
And what's interesting is they have embedded um, a commenting feature within the repository. So if you go to the website, you will see that family members of the POWs have commented and asked questions about their family members. So another example um, of digital scholarship um, is the Image of Research collection. So this is um, an, uh, a collection that has posters from graduate students and undergraduate students at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And these are posters that are visual representations of students' research. So it's not a poster about the research itself but it's a visual of what the research is trying to achieve. So it's kind of an artistic way of representing the research that students are doing in the sciences and the social sciences. It's really a fascinating way to capture um, student research in a very, very different way. So this is um, also a competition with cash prizes. Um, there's a grand event which in, during which the po winning posters are displayed. And as you can see, they've also mounted these as an Omeka collection, um, the posters and the descriptions of what students wrote about their work. Finally, um, this is Projects and Pedagogy, and this is from the um, Ohio Five, the Five Colleges of Ohio, which is a high learning consortium consisting of Denison University, Kenyon College, Oberlin College, Ohio Wesley University, and the College of Worcester. Um, in 2013, they were awarded a three-year um, 775,000 grants by the Mellon Foundation to strengthen the digital capabilities of libraries and embed the use of digital scholarship practices into the liberal arts curriculum. Um, the sites that I've listed above have um, projects, examples, and these are incredibly diverse. They're from, they're about fashion, they're about biology, they're about sociology. Um, they're really incredible, and um, I encourage you to go take a look. Um, there's also a blog that um, is updated uh, pretty often, um, and it's a really interesting insight about how liberal arts education and curriculum um, can be um, a scholarly communication and information literacy initiative um, within a consortium of liberal arts schools. Okay, so here are a number of upcoming events um, about scholarly communications. Um, Advancing Research Communication and Scholarship will take place in April of 2015 in Philadelphia. I already mentioned the Library Publishing Forum. Um, there's also the, uh, an upcoming series of webinars um, sponsored and planned by, um, sponsored by ACRL and planned by the Information Literacy and Scholarly Communications um, Intersections Task Force that grew out of the White Paper Task Force um, a couple years ago. So the first one is in December, and it's how to start the conversation um, to integrate information literacy and scholarly communication together in an organization. Um, and that will be followed by two other webinars in January and also in February. I also believe that there are presentations on this topic at the upcoming conference um, in Portland as well. For more information about these, um, I've included a list of links at the end of the presentation, but you can also go to the open access directory, um, which is sponsored by Simmons. Um, or hosted by Simmons. They have a whole schedule of events um, that list these and an incredible number of others. So to briefly summarize, um, all these examples are built on not only the tools of scholarship and disciplinary expertise, but also a willingness of librarians and faculty and students to experiment and share out not only the products of scholarship and creative activity, but also to share out the underlying processes, protocols, challenges, and workflows so others can emulate their work. 
Um, and I think that really speaks to the value that we all have for um, for open and for all the different ways that academic libraries can play a role in open. So here is um, a list of conferences, um, also a list of where I found the definitions that I um, presented in my slides. Um, also, there's a few articles listed here about data curation and library publishing. Um, and with that, um, I will open it up to questions or comments, or if anybody would like to share how they're celebrating Open Access Week on their campuses, that would be great. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today and for attending. And if you have any questions, please do add them to the chat box. Hi, Bob. Yes, they will. Um, I will. I will post them on SlideShare, and then I will share that link out to Margo, and I believe Margo can share that with the entire group. Um, so, um, so yes, they will be shared. And the recording will also be available um, very soon. I'm not sure exactly when, but very soon. Great. Thank you, Margo. I saw there's a question about the um, video on the Texas A&M site. Um, I don't know anything about that, but I'm sure Gail would love to get your question. Um, I found that really interesting as well. I'm trying to figure out how I can use that too. Okay. If at any point you have any questions about the presentation or anything else, please feel free to email me. Um, my email address is on your screen. Um, special thanks go to the librarians who um, shared information with me about their projects and initiatives. And also, um, huge thanks to Margo and Allison Payne of ACRL for all their help um, bringing this together. And uh, thank you all so much for coming today. And thanks to ACRL for sponsoring this webinar. Thanks and have a great day.